I heard some beeps and before I knew what was going on, like a SWAT team of medical professionals descended upon the room. You start just talking to someone up there saying, can everything just be okay? I think it's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do is to break that news to her. She started crying and probably I did as well. And weirdly, the more you hear others have gone through this, the more not alone you are. Making some bold decisions to protect his team from overbearing client demands, a true leader that demonstrates the proof that the right choices can protect your compatriots from harm. It should catalyze belief in oneself as an Indian, that we can do something no one on this planet's ever done. One could have probably said about Kennedy back in the 60s, America's got enough problems, why is it spending money trying to get man on the moon? And I don't see why other nations can't demonstrate acts of sheer audacity whilst also having problems of being in a growth market. But I think you've just got this amazing attitude for change mm. and for being willing to take that leap into the unknown and going, this sounds crazy, let's do it. Greetings, I'm Ashley Samuels McKenzie. And I'm Charles Parkinson. And welcome to How I Became. Where we unveil the unscripted journeys of inspirational figures. Hi, I'm Gautam Narayanan, and this is How I Became CMO of Third Way. Born in Mumbai, and by the age of seven, he spoke three languages experiencing early parts of life as the outsider, facing the pangs of racism, a force that sometimes could require bandages. From continent to continent, his love of the craft has taken him to many places. Experiencing the inside of a host of different agencies, companies and creative spaces. Making some bold decisions to protect his team from overbearing client demands. A true leader that demonstrates the proof that the right choices can protect your compatriots from harm. So for the next few hours, we shall tell the story of how to grow and progress your career incredibly, welcoming Gao Narayanan, Chief Marketing Officer at Third Way and former Managing Director in India of Wyden and Kennedy. Thank you very much for that. What a lovely intro. There we go. That's your life in a poem. <laughs> now for the full story of uh, how you got to where you are. Let's dive back. Let's go where it all begins. Mm. How far back do you want to go? Mumbai, <laughs> India. Mm. Okay. Set the scene. Paint yeah. the picture. Um, 1979. So, yeah, quite a long time ago. Uh, I was born in Mumbai, but my parents at the time were actually living in West Africa. Mm. So, mum came back to India for the birth. Uh, and then very shortly afterwards, when it was probably safe for me to travel, we went back to Liberia and West Africa. Mm. So weirdly, despite being born in India, the early, early parts of my childhood were actually in Liberia. Uh, so that was Why really, were they really in fascinating. Liberia? Dad was working there. Mm. Okay. So he, uh, he was an accountant. So he'd been there, I think, for about four or five years before I was, I was born. Mm. Uh, and then, yeah, I spent kind of my early childhood a little bit in India, but kind of the first material set of years, two, three years in West Africa, mm. which was fascinating. Were you first child, only child? Brothers? First and only. Okay. I think they'd had enough after me. <laughs> <laughs> this is too much. No more. No more. Or it can't get better than this. Either way, you pick. You pick. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, okay. So you spent this time in Liberia. Yeah. And uh, what you were learning a lot of languages. Yeah. How many languages did you... Um, so obviously Liberia, it was all in English, but when we went back to India, it's not a very, it's not like a very superpower or special skill. A lot of people in India at a young age grow up learning multiple languages. Mm -hmm. So you tend to go to, or at least we did on, in our family, an English speaking school. So you would taught all your lessons in English. Then you would speak your mother tongue. For me, it was Tamil. So our family's from the south of India. Then you tended to speak your state language or kind of Hindi because it was a big part of most states kind of languages and people's kind of learning. Um, so I spoke those three languages, English, Hindi and Tamil, uh, which were necessary. So yeah. living in Mumbai, you needed Hindi. At home, we spoke Tamil and in the school, you needed English. So it just became a thing that you did. Mm -hmm. What are some things about your culture that 
people might not know about South Indian culture or this, the region that your parents are from. Yeah. Was there anything that they taught you or you experienced that you you think about fond- fondly that people might not know? Um, I, I, I think this is a relatively known thing, but it is really important to me in that my specifically my mother does like the, the sense of hard work and applying yourself isn't lost wasn't lost on me mm. especially when you have a matriarch of the family so you know that sense of working hard is not really something that i would ever shied away from mm. and it was really fun i remember being at university and we were learning in business school around the protestant work ethic and a friend of mine who was protestant uh, at the time said well the Hindu work ethic seems to out outgun the Protestant work ethic. So whatever's happening in different parts of the world, we should probably kind of kind of bow down to the work ethic in different parts of the world. And he, I think that's quite a an Asian thing, whereby school and doing well at school and working hard and applying yourself is a big part of kind of culture. Yeah. And also with kind of immigrant families, that's an even bigger part of culture because I think whether you're overtly aware of that or not, the sense of sacrifice your parents have made, you kind of want to make sure you deliver on that. Mm-hmm. You kind of want to make sure you do that a bit of justice and don't muck around and don't achieve potential because they've given up a lot in order to move their family halfway across the world to a new country. Yeah. Mm. And the, the, the background of your, your, your parents and family, what was life like living in Mumbai? paint the picture of yep. Mumbai at that time for you it, it was an amazing time like kind of for me it was like I lived it was very close to my cousin my mum's sister so he and I would kind of go to school together and we just kind of muck around on the way to school I remember vividly two very very vivid memories one was going to school in the monsoon so you kind of had these welly boots and like if you think you know like Peppa Big splashing in puddles was a thing you should go to India, to Mumbai during the monsoon. Like it is just soaking wet kind of all the way for about, you know, six weeks. So it was a fantastic life with family. Community and family were very, very important. Mm -hmm. And the second thing I I remember very vividly, very cliched, was just playing cricket a lot. Yeah, I think I got my kind of Gladwellian 10,000 hours by the age of seven (laughs) because that's all we did. Every spare time you had where you weren't studying or working, you were playing cricket. And I didn't really enjoy like TV or music or all that. I just wanted to play sport. Mm -hmm. I remember once like the whole community, there was this very famous TV show that everyone was watching. And my cousin and I just went out and played cricket for like three hours. And I didn't like batting, so I just bowled for three hours. He just batted for three hours. And then he hit me for a six and we lost the ball and we're like, all right, it's time to go in. (laughs) (laughs) So it's just that kind of, and I think a lot of people my age, no matter where you live in the world, those halcyon days of sport and community and being outside Mm -hmm. was really, really fun. Like family was super important. We kind of lived in a slightly extended family setup with me and my mum living with my mum's sister and their kids. So I'm very, very close and tight with them. So it was kind of a, wholesome and just kind of fun and relaxed and family vibe it was really cool and Mumbai what, what's it known for it's a thriving city what, what's it known for yeah I, I think from the outside looking in everyone talks about the craziness and the noise and the and the kind of aromas and the energy but when you live there it's just life so it's like you know if you're living in London or Mumbai when you go to somewhere strange like I don't know if you go to Crete it seems very very quiet but if you live in Crete that's just life yeah. so it was crazy paced, it was full of noise, it was full of energy. But again, you sort of, well, I did anyway, feed off that in terms of this is the environment you're in and it sort of, at a very young age, sort of shapes you. And there's a sense of, you know, you need to be relatively relentless to do small things. And again, I'm talking back in the 80s where getting on a bus or getting on a train is not an easy piece because you're just, there are so many other people trying to get on that bus and mm-hmm. get on that train and get on that carriage. So this sense of kind of relentlessness, but also just it's full of energy and there is no quiet. So again, your ability to deal with lots of noise and lots of situations, lots of energy is absolutely essential. Mm-hmm. Shrinking violets need not apply sort of thing. Mm-hmm. 
And so you, you took your cricket prowess and expertise to the UK. Eventually you moved to the UK and you become cricket captain. Uh, I did, yeah. I was uh, captain of the school, which is really, really fun. Uh, and then also captained uh, my university team as well. How so, old were you when you moved to the UK? Uh, we, I, My first birthday here was when I was eight. Okay. okay. So eight years old. Uh, I remember it vividly. We had a Mr. Wimpy party at the Wimpy restaurant mm. because I couldn't go to McDonald's because there was no veggie burger. Ah. And the Wimpy had the spicy bean burger. So... Yes. That's what we did. Uh, we got in a lot of trouble because a few of us from my class were kicking Mr. Wimpy and we got told off. Mm -hmm. I remember that very, very oh, vividly. Dear. But yeah, it was kind of very strange. Like those kinds of things didn't happen and you didn't go to a restaurant to have a party. You just, we did anyway, just did stuff at home with family and friends. Yeah. So again, it was just kind of just assimilating to a sort of different culture. It was really, really, it was really interesting and very, very different. Yeah, how did you find that adjusting period? Um. I think children, and I've seen this in my own kids, are very resilient. Mm. And they just, like, you give them, like for me, a ball or whatever, you just go and play sport with anyone. Mm. So you don't really notice it and you're not aware of the, the degree of change, also because your family create an environment within which you feel super safe. Yeah. But I noticed the difference very, very quickly. Like my mum says that she brought over an Indian child to the UK and within about five weeks I'd lost my accent completely. We were literally phoning family at home and mum was just like, listen to him speak. <laughs> and everyone thought I was making up an accent and then she's like, no, this is what he sounds like. I, I've got an English child and you know, are five weeks in. So that was, that was a probably more of a shock for her than me. I just sort of wanted to fit in. Yeah. And the other piece I've found was um, we went to school and I came home from the first day of school. I was like, great. Homework? No. Why not? Like, oh, we don't do homework. She's like, oh, okay. The next day she goes to school and she's like, well, listen, my son's come over from India. And like at that age, again, it's, I wasn't special. You were learning your, by the age of seven, eight years old, you were learning your 12, 13, 14 times table. You were doing long division. You were doing a lot of stuff that they weren't doing here. Mm. So the next day I was the only kid who got given a whole load of homework. <laughs> ah, thanks mum. Like, thanks mum. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and this is Dulwich College? No, this was a primary school okay. called Beach Home Primary School. Right. So I was there, I was there for about two or three years. It was really, really fun mm -hmm. because you just got to play sport a lot. Uh, I was, I uh, was, um, I had two things everyone knew about me in school. One, I was very good at quick sums, which is like every day you go into class and you do them little sums. Mm, yeah. Another thing is I hated drinking milk. Mm. So back in the day when you got free school milk, yeah. huh. mine one was the only one. So if I beat anyone at drinking milk, they would get rinsed in class. Like everyone would make fun of them because I just hated drinking milk. So those were my kind of two pieces, like the quick sums kid and the slow milk drinker. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of all right sports, so that sort of helped. Nice. <laughs> I think that's quite a good democratizer when, as a child and when you go to a new place, if you can do something like sport that naturally draws you into a group of kids. Yeah. Nice. So how was that? How you do eventually go to Dulwich College, not far from where I went to went, went school, Graveney. Yeah, oh, too, nice. Too far away. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I did a few 11 plus exams and I got into Dulwich, which was really, really good school. Uh, very different because again, I'd never understood that world of private school. We're kind of like working, aspiring to be middle-class family. Mm -hmm. And Dulwich College was very, very different. Just the way everyone spoke and conducted themselves and just, you know, the things they did, the places they went on holiday, like the equipment they had. I, I was never, never went without anything, but it was just yeah. very, very different to the stuff that I was sort of used to. And then once again, sport became a real helpful democratizer. Like I remember very vividly, you were like at two groups for rugby, the people who were in the team and the people who weren't. And I was in the people who weren't on the team because they'd never seen me play rugby and I'd never played before. I remember getting the ball and just running around everyone and scoring a try. And this teacher's like, Ryan, and have you ever played rugby before? I was like, no, sir. And he goes, well, it's a good start. <laughs> and quickly after that, you sort of jump into the school team. Mm -hmm. And again, for me, all this kind of outsiderness dissolved very, very quickly, actually mostly through sport. 
because suddenly it makes you fit in and it makes you sort of belong. Yeah. And that was actually really, really easy, whether it was at school or arriving to a country for the first time or meeting some new people for the first time. It was a very, very quick democratizer, really. So you go to university and then you enter into the world of work, yep. I guess. How, yeah, where, yeah. how do things start in a career? Um, so I didn't really know advertising as an industry existed. So one of my best mates from uni, who still, I'm still very good friends with, um, he was just like applying to all of these kind of ad agencies. I'm like, what's that? Mm. And he goes, well, they're the company that do the ads you see on TV for, whether it's Lynx or Nike or whoever it is. I'm like, oh, I thought the company did that. So he's like, you should apply to a couple of them. So I did some marketing because I just knew I wanted business brand creativity was my thing. I just yeah. didn't know advertising existed. Mm. Applied to a bunch of places and it was final year and it was super busy uh, and I had coursework and exams and stuff going on. And I applied to a bunch of agencies, got a job, I think in early Jan. And I'm just like, okay, that's done. And if I'm being really honest, I hadn't heard of the company I'd applied for that much. You did a bit of Googling, yeah. but it wasn't really something I knew, but I got the job and I thought, well, if I've got a job, I'm done. I can focus on other stuff, yeah. better work. And obviously because you need a bit of play, right? Yeah. Uh, and then I arrive at this place, at this advertising agency in London, which was great. This kind of massive seven, four building in Marlborough. People were amazing, really, really lovely and really, really friendly. And I arrived, it was like the Wednesday or Thursday of that week. And on everyone's desk, there's like a copy, I think, of either marketing or marketing week mm. with a picture of the Guinness horses from that very, very famous commercial, yeah. Guinness Surfer. And inside that copy of marketing week, what's on the cover, it says AMV BBDO kind of agency of the year. Yeah. And inside it was an envelope with two 50 pound notes. I'm like, advertising is amazing. Wow, I like <laughs> right? this place. For yeah. someone who's just come out of university, <laughs> I, A, I'd never seen a 50 pound note before, but <laughs> now B, you to have two of them, I'm yeah. like, this is brilliant. Whoa. Ran home, like, mom, look, they got a bonus. That's the last bonus I saw for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a really, really good start. And what that really taught you was you were in a relatively special, special place. Mm. And what you get to find out once you join the industry or what a special place, Abbott Mead, that is the way I called it. I called it Abbott Mead, it then became AMB BBDO. What a special agency it was. What I really liked about it, it, was, it wasn't trying to be too cool. Mm. It was just a very grown up agency that had big clients and really valued creativity. Mm. Now we did some amazing work for The Economist, for Guinness, but we also did some very, very good, effective work for the likes of BT and Sainsbury's and the National Lottery as well. So we had some really creative clients, but we also tried to do really effective work mm -hmm. for big populist kind of brands. Mm. And you sort of really understood the importance of talking to the populace, right? Yeah. Not trying to do advertising for the cool kids, but trying to do advertising for the masses, not trying to do advertising for advertising people there was a real sense of we need to do advertising that gets the real world talking yeah, rather than gets the creative community talking amongst itself or talking to itself. And that was a really big lesson you learned at Abbott Mead at the time. Mm, yeah. And yeah, David Abbott, unfortunately, I never got to work with him. I think he'd retired a couple of years before I started. But that was a big part of his piece was to do really, really great work that the public would talk about. Yeah. It's interesting you know, how our, our different guest paths cross. So yes. Gav Thomas yeah. was, I think, account manager of the Guinness account when they made the horses yeah. ad and was in New York at the time. And so if you haven't heard that episode, it's the, the story of the founder of Gift Gaff and, and story. So your paths... Literally like ships yes. passing in the night. Exactly. No, with the, so we'd, I had heard of Gav. He was a very kind of like colorful character and kind of quite charismatic, mm -hmm. as I saw from the episode that you guys recorded with him. But our paths never, never literally crossed because I think he'd left the agency before I came. Or he may have been there, but I was such an insignificant, tiny grad that uh, I never kind of caught his, his attention. But it, it is interesting that there are certain agencies that do attract the best talent. And that's the reason why they become brilliant, right? Yeah. So whether it's Widen and Kennedy or... It's Abbott Mead or, you know, 
agencies like Uncommon mm -hmm. or Adam and Eve, like mm -hmm. they tend to create a culture where they bring in the best talent from around the world across different geographies and different departments. So I think that's really, really important. Yeah. So am I right in saying that you spent the next 17 years with AMV or BBDO? Uh, that... Yes, yeah, so I started in 2001, left to go to Joburg in 2014, and then was there until 2018. Yeah, yeah. so wow. 17 years in one kind of network. So you had become, by you joined in 2001, by 20... Well, what, by by a certain point, you get to board account director. Yeah, so I was uh, grad intake 2001, I think from, and then something really interesting happened to me. One of the kind of managing partners of the agency had a really good, smart idea of creating an entity that served British Telecom mm -hmm. from a creative and a media joint venture. So we worked with PhD and they had a really smart bunch of people working in a in a division called Rocket that tended to work in a more kind of creative, different, interesting media planning way. Mm, nice. So basically, I was asked with a board account planner and two board account kind of creative directors mm -hmm. to go and set up this agency, uh, which we ended up calling Lunar BBDO. So that was fascinating for me because I went from a... 300, 350 person agency to a, what was a four person from our side and probably three person from the other side startup. Wow. So you went from all the trappings of like support and production and admin staff and all of that stuff to then everything from we've got a new business meeting to we need polyboard to we need a producer to we need a freelance designer was all down to me because I was the account guy. Yeah. And it was I was so out of my depth because you went from talking to brand managers to speaking to CEOs, but it was such a quick learning curve. Mm. And the creative directors I was with were brilliant and the the planner I was with was amazing. I learned so much from him. And you suddenly learn how to grow up really really quickly. And we did some yeah. phenomenal work. I did probably my the work I'm most proud of and had the most meaning on uh, in, in impact on my life. We did some amazing work with Samaritans, which you know won a bunch of awards. It was great, and it seemed to really help the brand, which was great. But I remember I was talking to the kind of basically the, the, the head of marketing and fundraising at Samaritans, and he said he got an email just around Christmas time because these two young girls had heard our campaign, and it said, "Look, it didn't solve their problem." but it cheered them up and made them feel better. Nice. And that was quite a nice thing to hear. And don't get me wrong, I love doing marketing communications that help sell Guinness and sell broadband for BT and all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But when you can have an impact on people's world when life isn't so great, mm -hmm. that's really, really helpful when you can try and help Samaritans for whom we, we just did pro bono work for them. We obviously didn't charge them. Mm -hmm. uh, when you can try and make a material difference to humans that aren't having a great time, that's really special. What would we search on YouTube to find that vi that advert? We'll play uh, it over the video when you talk about it. Let me remember. It was called the Doodles campaign. Okay. So the, the, the we actually hired a psychologist because we wanted to understand what young men were going through. So the campaign came about because the client said to us, there is a problem we've noticed that if you're aged between 18 and 24, the biggest cause of death is actually suicide. Not cancer, not being run over by a bus, not anything else, which is quite a scary statistic. And those data points or those numbers were massively inflated if you were from areas of kind of depressed economic areas. So for example, the mining areas in Wales, yeah. the ex-steel industry in, in the north around Sheffield, around there, the kind of dock areas and kind of Glasgow. So we took this brief really, really seriously. This wasn't a brief to go and do award-winning work. This was a brief where you were very conscious of the impact of the work. And the psychologist did a load of focus groups for people who had either self-harmed or attempted suicide. And what he noticed, he was a brilliant guy. What he noticed was there was lots of bravado because it's young guys in not very affluent areas mm -hmm. and you can't show weakness. Mm. 
they wouldn't say much. They would sort of like not be very expressive because that's also not the thing you do. And what he noticed was when he gave them stuff to write down, they were all doodling stuff, right? As a way to express their feelings, their anguish, their grief. And he said, look, I don't know if there's anything in this, but they don't say much and it's difficult to get things out of them. But every one of these young men was kind of doodling stuff. So then the planner and I saw that, talked to the creative team about it. And when you're in a four-person agency, you literally walk to the other desk <laughs> and go, hey, guys, I've, we've thought we've seen this observation. What do you think? And the creative directors and a very young creative team who were brilliant came up with this amazing campaign where there was lots of doodles that showed angst and frustration and just stuff that you'd want to get off your mind. But when you stepped back, it formed a larger collage mm -hmm. of a troubled person. Yeah. And we found a fantastic illustrator to do it for free. Uh, and then we basically created a kind of kind of visual campaign and we found this amazing animator who again created created it for us for free because if it's something like Samaritans and you've got the pull of AMV, you kind of try and do stuff that's good. So that's the campaign I'm sort of most proud of. I think it won some stuff for Can and it got into the D&AD book and all of that was great. And don't get me wrong, that was really, really good. But having an impact on people was really, really helpful. And then the thing that we really wanted to push for Samaritans, there were two things we wanted to push. They had like a, this is going back in the day, a tech service, <laughs> right? And we wanted to make sure people were able to communicate with that and that worked really, really well. And then the stature of the Samaritans changed from a kind of slightly lecturing, finger-wagging organization to something that young people could connect with. Mm -hmm. And, like, and that was really, really important to us. We had some very, very clear metrics on brand stuff we wanted to shift and being approachable and non-judgmental mm -hmm. was a really important part of that. So again, it's like doing amazing creativity that was linked to a really interesting observation by someone who understands humans yeah. to then create something that works in the real world was like a really interesting formula that I took with me when I started to kind of, you know, all the kind of campaigns I did. That was kind of the secret with me, which is get to the human cultural truth, make that big creative leap, and then make sure it's effective to the audience you're trying to communicate to. It's not effective to you as an advertising person. Yeah, and I think that's, I think that's one of the my most favorite things about advertising when it really does connect with people and they get something from it. That feeling of warmth after you see a certain ad, you know, it wasn't really about the brand; it was about how they wanted to make you feel. Yeah. I think that's so important and special for what advertising can do for the world. Yeah, and also this kind of notion of design. This so this campaign also brought out to me one of the things the psychologist said was, "Look, the level of literacy in these parts of the country mm. wasn't great." So we intentionally made the campaign very visual mm -hmm. because that was really, really important. And then there was another thing around Samaritans, like you can't be seen seeing a Samaritans ad. That's gonna sound kind of tautological. The reason is if you're looking at a Samaritans ad, it means there's a problem. Yeah. And people, and again, I'm going back a few years, this sense of kind of emotional well-being and kind of cries for help and that wasn't a thing. And especially amongst young men, they weren't allowed to. So what they were looking at was a piece of art. But hidden within that was a message around, please ask for help. So 2009, you go through an experience a lot of people can relate with having your first child. <laughs> yeah. And this was no easy experience. It was yes. very challenging and difficult walk yeah. us through the events of that um so as ever you kind of try and prepare for having a child and people give you lots of advice and family are there to support <laughs> but in all reality it's kind of you kind of make it up as you go along um so we had our son akshay and we were in well we kingston hospital uh and things were happening and then suddenly the whole emotion and energy in the room changed this is and the room where your child is being born yeah yeah this and, is kind of and, in the delivery room yeah. and the delivery room so yeah it was kind of in the ward normal delivery room we were there 
and everything was sort of going on and then suddenly the whole thing changed i heard some beeps and before i knew what was going on like a SWAT team of medical professionals descended upon the room and before i knew what was going on my wife had been wheeled into theater and what are you I, thinking at this point? and i was like mm -hmm. i have no idea what's going on and rightly the team's priority is mother and child not the father so i get given some scrubs and i get told right come to this place and i'm like what is going on so you, you go from terrified you yeah. go from kind of trying to be supportive as much as you can to your wife to being absolutely petrified because you have no idea what's going on so you basically put on the scrubs and you just kind of walk down the corridor and obviously kind of i'm relatively religious you start just talking to someone up there saying can everything just be okay mm. but you're still not exactly sure what's happening yeah. so we wander down the corridor and then you get in there and then after about four or five minutes when that procedure is happening they explain that my son had wrapped his wrapped himself around his umbilical cord and was basically strangling himself so you go from everything being normal which is a very unnormal or abnormal situation which is giving birth because you've mm. never done it so you don't know what's going to happen to then going into an emergency procedure to then not knowing what's going on to be left in a room on your own mm. and someone throwing some scrubs at you and suddenly you're just like okay what do i do now and you just basically go where you're told to go and you just hope and pray that everything's going to be okay and thankfully it was mm -hmm. and where were you at in your career at this point where was i i was still at amv i was I think I was on, I was a board account director uh, and I had made the transition after we did the lunar BBDO thing to come back to the agency. And I'd, I'd noticed two sort of trends leading up to 2006, 7, 8 that I thought were going to be interconnected. One was the march of digital mm -hmm. and then the second was kind of globalization. And I thought one would feed the other. So I was interested in having worked only on very local national accounts. So I worked on British Telecom and I worked on a bunch of kind of UK based companies, Samaritans. I worked on Tetra Pak, but based for the UK. Yeah. So it was all very, very national. I decided to kind of have a go at doing some international business and kind of worked on learned so much working with Mars. And they were very, very great at not being led by trends. And I really respected them for that. And also the people were really, really lovely. I had a great bunch of clients we worked with, did a lot of work on Mars Bar and Snickers and a kind of bunch of work on, on the chocolate business uh, for UK and Western Europe. Yeah. So that was really, really fun. So you get an interesting offer, 2014, not to be in the UK. Yes. What happens? Um, so we pitched for um, Guinness. So we were working on, it actually started in about 2010 or 11. So one of my uh, bosses on Mars, we were basically had a chance to work on a global positioning for Guinness. Right, so Guinness, the kind of was the flagship brand for AMV, did amazing, amazing, amazing work. Um, and what they wanted to do was to create a global positioning for Guinness, which is going to be very, very difficult because the product and the pricing and the distribution and the possession of the brand was very, very different in different parts of the world, right? Ireland saw it as a gift to the world, right? If you go to Lagos at the time, they were selling more Guinness in Lagos than they were in Dublin, <laughs> right? And it's a much stronger product because in the sea journey from Ireland to Africa, they loaded it with alcohol so it could survive the journey. So, I went and the numbers right, but whatever it is, three, four percent in the UK was kind of six, seven percent uh, in Lagos. So I went to Lagos and had a Guinness. Yeah. You know, you've been yeah, drinking. It's really exports. strong. Yeah, the the FES strong. is very, very strong. Mm. You go to Korea. It's a super cool lifestyle, aspirational fashion brand. So very, very different depending on where you are in the world. So we embarked on this amazing process of coming up with a global positioning. But there was couple of complications right one is bbdo had the business in western europe so uk and ireland where the business in north america 
and we had the business in Asia. Saatchi's had the business in Africa, and Africa was a big part of their kind of strategy and volume and also their heritage for Guinness. So we had to work with Saatchi's, and it was awesome fun, right? Everyone talks about kind of agencies and all the stuff we get up to and the, the battles that we have, but what you ended up getting was a bunch of creatives and planners and account people trying to do something phenomenal for one of the greatest brands on the planet. And we all just got into a room and said, can we just make this work? And we had two fantastic clients who said, look, we just, the opportunity to create a global positioning for one of the most iconic brands on the planet doesn't come around very often. Mm -hmm. And everyone just played ball and we just got on with it and we had real fun. Mm -hmm. And we created, trying to unify the different markets and regions was hard. Not just because of politics and egos, but just the nature of the relationship of that beer with humans, with consumers, with drinkers, was very, very different. So we worked on that, came up with the positioning, and they had a brilliant CMO. We presented some great work, and he said, here's my advice to you, do not make this work. What you need to do is give the positioning to each of the regions, let them make their own work. Because then they will take the positioning and make it their own and make it real. Smart. Yeah. Whereas if you try and foist communications that land the positioning, you're going to undermine some brilliant strategic and creative thinking in the form of one execution. Mm. And I think his vision was this needs to be a position positioning for decades. The foundation seemed really, really strong. Don't ruin it by trying to create a global ad. Mm. So we handed it over to the regions and they all started creating their own work. But in the meantime, there was a pitch for Guinness Africa. So I worked on the BBDO team to work on that pitch, which we won. And I got on really, really well with the chief creative officer of our South African office, a guy called Mike. Uh, and then I remember it distinctly in the AMV reception, I think I was queuing for lunch, missed a call, and I knew it was Mike, and I thought, oh, better listen to the voicemail. And I'm not going to do a terrible South African accent, because Mike will probably hear this, but it was basically something along the lines of, hey, gal, so I've had this crazy idea. Why don't you come to Joburg and help run the agency? And I was just like, sorry, say what? Uh, I'd never been to Joburg thus far. Right, I hadn't set foot, apart from my time in Liberia, I had never set foot on the continent. So obviously the first thing you do is go and speak to your wife about it. Uh, and she was kind of intrigued because her father had traveled around the world and she loved that experience. Really helpfully, her sister and her sister's husband were working in Lagos. Okay. Right. So when we spoke to them about Joburg, they were just like, oh my God, you've got to do that because a bunch of their friends or colleagues had gone from Lagos to Joburg and said how awesome it was. So we said, yes, <laughs> let's do it. So off we went, jumped on a plane, took the family. Um, my wife was incredibly pregnant with our third child, Alyssa, at the time. Wow. So I think she, we had like a two week, two weeks later, she wouldn't have been able to fly. Wow. So I went December, November, met the people in Joburg, so I was the kind of deputy MD of the Joburg office. And then I was the regional director for the African operations for BBDO. So we had offices in, in, in Lagos and Nairobi. So what would that actually mean? What were your responsibilities? Really simple. In Joburg, it was to help Boniswa, who was the MD. And then she then got made CEO and I got promoted to MD over time to run the office. And then across Africa was to kind of continue to build the BBDO network because we were seeing a lot of clients started taking Africa really, really seriously. So we had some phenomenal partners. We worked with Diageo, we worked with Visa. So like people were starting to take Africa seriously. So they wanted to make sure if they created work for the continent, the regional work for the continent worked east and west. And it was really, really important that marketers, clients, business people, especially those in central hubs, understood that Africa is not a country. Right. And, you know, you'd hear very, very cliche things of oh, Bill, Bill Clinton saying, I've landed in Africa. 
he would never say I've landed in Europe. He'd say I'm in France mm. or I'm in the UK or I'm in the Netherlands, wherever that is. So there's this kind of, we just going to, the whole of Africa, we were going to paint as one thing. And that's not true. You go to Lagos, within one country, the dialects and the, the, the language and the culture is just so, 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 so diverse. So we had to try and make sure that we advise our clients to do great work across the continent, which we had really, really a lot of fun doing. And then the Joburg piece was to help turn around the Joburg agency, which is a phenomenally creative agency, like all agencies were going. It was in one of its troughs, and we had to kind of get together and try and, and try and lift it. So that was that. What was the opportunity that these brands were seeing in the continent of Africa, yeah. do you think? Well, there was two parts to it. One was that I always call it the, if you see, and this is not a, a, a kind of disparaging look on The Economist, I love The Economist, but if you see the narrative on The Economist, it's very, very shallow. But the narrative on The Economist was Africa rising. Mm -hmm. right? Everyone was talking about it. Before I arrived, when I first went to Lagos, literally everywhere you looked was a building site that was P&G's offices. Unilever are coming, so-and-so are coming, so-and-so are coming. Because you've got a country with, you know, 100 million plus people, growing economy. South Africa was positioning itself as the S in BRICS. And then the Nigerians not wanting to be outdone. We're going to call it the Brinks. So it was just really moving fast as a continent. And it was really, really exciting. But with that energy and movement comes a lot of complexity and nuance, which tends to get lost in the kind of slightly shallow understanding of Africa rising. Mm. What I found fascinating about that was the creativity and the kind of tech ingenuity. Like my favorite example is, I'm sure you guys have heard of Zempesa, which was the kind of basically Kenyan kind of mobile payment system that they had come up with, right? Phenomenally successful. And I remember working with one of our clients, trying to talk to them about mobile payments, and they were like, oh, we have this mobile payment system, it's really cool. I'm like, but you can't go to Kenya, talk about a mobile payment system, because they got there five years ago, mm. right? Yeah. So you, have, you can't have that strategy across the, across the region, because the Kenyans will laugh you out of the country. So it's those kinds of things where you really need to get under the kind of skin of what's happening culturally, what's happening technologically. And it was phenomenal. And obviously you got like in Cape Town, they had this kind of notion of the kind of that Silicon Mountain piece around Cape Town and the tech piece. And there was a similar one just outside Nairobi. So when you'd go there and when you'd get out of the offices and you'd go and visit people and you go and talk to people, it was just phenomenal restless energy and creativity and that kind of like kind of that hustle mentality was really really fascinating you have a tricky moment while you're out there there's a client <laughs> yes tell us about this tricky client and it involves firing i'm going to leave it there and let you tell the story <laughs> um so i won't name them obviously um we we picked up Weirdly enough, it was one of the first wins we had as an agency. So I flew out to Joburg, uh, and one of the things I realized is the agency was a little bit of creative tribes, non-creative tribes. So there's like a two-class system, a two kind of camps, which you get in a lot of agencies, right? And obviously, you can't function as a creative company if you've got two people pulling in different directions. Yeah. So what I thought we needed was a big win. And the biggest way in which an agency can do that is to pitch for a piece of business, right? So we pitched for this piece of business and we won it. And it was a phenomenal pitch in that the whole agency pitched, right? We had a brilliant idea that we came up with and then the whole agency had to talk about what that idea meant to them, mm. right? And we created a little book and we gave to the client and the client like almost started crying when we were pitching. So we were phenomenal. We did some great work and we subverted the category and we flipped the narrative and we did some really, really, really good work. But over time, what was obvious was this client was not treating us well, right? They were in the retail space, so it was fast paced. There was a lot of pressure and we get that. Right? We had lots of clients. BBD had lots of clients that were in the retail space and was fast paced but there's no excuse for abuse of your people. So after a while, the management team got together and said, look, this is a problem. 
because this client is eroding the culture of the agency. Our people are getting abused. And as a management team, we have to stand up for them. And then we went to speak to the client and said, look, this has to stop. It didn't. And then what we ended up doing was parting ways. Now, everyone talks about what a statement is and how kind of brave you were. And all of those things are important. For me, there were two things that were really, really important. One is to show the people that we are standing up for them. That's really, really important, right? Because this wasn't our fault, it was definitely them. That was critical for me, is to show that we are standing up for our people because you have to protect them. And that's become a bigger thing in all businesses, especially marketing communications and standing up for your people. The second part is to be really empathetic is there might be consequences to that. You might have to, if you lose a large paying client, unless you pick another one up really, really quickly, there might be consequences of letting some people go. So this sense of bravado or how brave you were to fire a client, you need to be very careful about that. Mm. Because if you end up having to make two, three, five, one percent of your population, of your staff redundant because of the loss of that business, they don't think you're being very brave. Did you have to do that in this yes. scenario? Yeah. We ended up having to let go, not many, but of a few people, mm -hmm. which wasn't easy. And as ever, they'd done nothing wrong, mm. but that's what happens when you work in a business. You have to right size the business based on the real, your revenues and cost. And it was, it was very difficult. It was very difficult. I guess what you're doing there is you're, you know, if when looking at the whole agency, the whole, all the members of the agency as a, as a whole, is a benefit for, yeah. because you're not having a load of people being mistreated the whole yeah. time, but a few of the people take the, take the um take the loss and take yeah. the hit yeah which is sad. And it, it's difficult and again as a leader you realize that doing the right thing is hard mm. doing the right thing can be unpopular doing the right thing can have negative consequences um even if you don't you know even if you're not happy with those consequences but you have to be resolute that you are doing the right thing because had we not made that decision i think what happens as a as a kind of follow-up is a lot of really good people leave because they're like, well, you're not standing up for us. Yeah. You're not protecting us. We've done nothing wrong. We're being professional in how we're conducting ourselves. But because this client isn't, we end up taking the fall for that. And what ends up happening, you lose a lot of good people, you lose your culture. And then that's a very, very slippery slope. So you spend a bit of time in Joburg. Yeah. And then bam, more change. <laughs> <laughs> Something else crazy comes along. Yeah. 2018, what yes. happens? Um, so I had basically a kind of four year visa and we knew kind of time, it was probably time to come back home, mm. uh, back to the UK. Um, and something Brexit happened, which wasn't great in my opinion, each, each their own. A lot of my friends that I was speaking to was just like, I wouldn't rush back to the UK if you can help it Gal. I was just like, well, kind of want to come home because it is home after all. Uh, and then a few conversations happen and I almost take a job in kind of an the Anzac region. Didn't quite work out. And then my wife says to me, well, it is quite a long way away. I'm like, it hasn't moved since the 12 interviews I had to do at three in the morning. Mm -hmm. It's still as far away as it always was. Um, I have a few more conversations. And as these things happen, I once again talk to my friend at university mm. who taught me about advertising agencies in the first place. He was at Wyden and Kennedy and I think he was in there either Amsterdam or New York office. And I was just chatting to him because what are you thinking? I said, yeah, you know, I'm thinking of this, I'm thinking of that. And he said, there might be a thing at Wyden. Would you be interested? And I was like, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll have a chat. Obviously they're a fantastic agency. And then one thing leads to another and then I have a few chats and then I accept the job to go to Wyden and Kennedy to run their India office, which is really, really good wow. fun. So this is the country crazy. you were born in. You hadn't been back to live there since you yep. were what? Six, seven. Seven years old. Yeah. What was, what was that like? Uh, it, it was amazing because A, the most important thing obviously was my mum was very happy because mm. she moved back to India and we were going to live in Delhi and she was in Bangalore. So we were going to be three hours away from her oh, rather than getting to Joburg and London was a lot longer. So that's the most important thing about that move. My mother was very happy. But in addition to that, it was 
really interesting symmetry in terms of a nation on the rise and on the march. So, again, if you look at those economist headlines, it sort of charts this kind of growth in India as well, that India was starting to deliver 5, 6, 7, 8% growth year on year on year. So it's a very exciting time to be in India. And it was a very, very similar kind of acknowledgement from a lot of global companies and also a lot of local companies to either local companies wanted to kind of grow outside of India and take on the world. And then all the big global companies from Google to Meta or well, Facebook as they were then uh, to Amazon, to Spotify, to Netflix were all kind of piling into India because they saw phenomenal kind of growth and they wanted to be like they saw China like a decade before. They wanted to be there on the ground floor to kind of drive that commercial growth. So it was really, really exciting. On a personal level, being back in the country of your birth was really, really fascinating, really, really interesting. And I, th I think the biggest shock or learning for me is I probably way overestimated my understanding of India because they, I haven't, they call people like me an NRI, a non-resident Indian, mm. right? I look like this, but then as soon as I open my mouth, it's obvious I'm not from around there. And also cultural references and understanding technology, understanding business, understanding markets, understanding marketing, understanding advertising. You don't have any of that kind of cultural knowledge that I would have in the UK because yeah. you grow up in places and a lot of marketing communication just connecting with us emotionally. And it's very, very hard to do that in India because I wasn't, you know, hadn't lived there for a while and I didn't speak many of the languages that and it will enable you to connect with people at scale. But it was really, really exciting. Are you an agency or brand that would like to work with our production company, Unity and Motion? If so, contact us at unityinmotion.com. We produce commercials and social content for brands such as Chanel, Amazon, Reebok, Harrods, The Ritz, and many more. Now back to the show. And so for anybody who doesn't know about Wyden and Kennedy, just give a little bit of context as to, you know, what this organization is yeah. about. Um, w weirdly enough, I wasn't kind of this crazy Wyden fanboy before I joined. And actually, and they was, do exist. There are people who absolutely well, love it, look, Wyden. It, it's, it's like there are lots of Nike fanboys and fangirls, right? And the, Wyden has a similar kind of stature in the creative community, right? They were an independent agency, so they were able to take decisions based on what they felt was right, not what the stock market told them was right, because you don't have a holding company or a network. Which you spent the last 17 your years, yes, you're pretty much your yeah. whole and career in For me, it's not network. like better or worse, it's just different, different. Mm. right? There's a different economic model, there's a different creative model, there's a different cultural model, mm. and none of them are better at every single ad agency from a tiny design shop to WPP, all want to do phenomenal work to drive cultural and commercial growth, mm -hmm. right? They frame it in lots of different ways. But if you work at Wyden and Kennedy, you've got the autonomy because the great Dan Wyden spent most of the end of his career tying that company up into knots so that it could never be sold, ah. right? That independence was everything absolutely everything to them because they can make decisions based on what they want felt was right for their people for their company for their clients for their culture not because you've got quarterly stocks to re re respond to and targets that are very very short term yeah. and again not about better or worse some people will prefer it others won't mm. it's just different and it's a different model and it's a different kind of culture that i was assimilating myself into so i had to change my kind of mental mode of how I operated within that company because it's really important as an MD, as the person who ran the office to make sure I was sympathetic and drove the company culture rather than my version of what I picked up in a different company. And that's really, really important. So what is your approach? For some listening who is thinking about, you know, would like to become an MD one day or maybe is on the path to, what do you do in your first week as an MD, what's your process? How did you handle that? The, the process is really simple, right? There's a kind of like very simple formula, which is a combination of humility and curiosity. 
right? It's really, really simple. I am going to Joburg. I am going to New Delhi. Walk in there being very clear that you don't know anything, right? And I don't just mean that as a kind of like statement you make to the to the company, but really understand that you know nothing. And your job is to listen and learn from people who know something. You have different skills, but around how things are done, how the country works, how the economy works, how culture works, how creativity works, it is different. So be okay with that. And, and my general thing is it's good to acknowledge that internally. But if you make that a statement and your behavior subscribes to that, it's actually really empowering for the company. Because if you're working in the cultures that are quite, you do what your boss says, more so than not. So the national culture of kind of India, there's a lot of conformity in terms of conforming and these are all amazing qualities about deferring to your elders and having respect for people of different generations. There's not very much questioning of authority, right? And Wyden and Kennedy is the complete opposite, right? You question authority because the reason I hire you is because you're smart and you can do stuff. And when you start in a kind of hippiesville in Portland, Oregon, those are the kinds of people that you attract, right? Who aren't just going to say, yes, ma'am, no, sir, three bags full, sir. You actually want people to really push and challenge. Mm. And if that's not the norm in a culture you move into, making a statement that the MD knows nothing and is here to learn from the company is important to state that you empower people. Then you have to deliver that in terms of behavior. Really small things. If you're in a meeting room, you go, I don't understand this. What do you mean? And you get other people to talk and explain stuff to you. And that's really, really important in terms of a culture of peace. So this notion of really understanding that you know nothing, being okay with that. You have to be kind of zen about that, right? And then the second part is the really important part is the curiosity piece. There's no point in saying, I know nothing and that's cool. You've got to do something about that. And the way you do something about that, you do lots of listening. So the art of having done it in South Africa. I was able to do the kind of same process in India, which is you just sit with every person who works for the company and you listen to them. What, what kind of questions do you ask them? Yeah. Just how's the company? How's your life? Understand them better. What's the role of creativity? How do we get into culture? What's good? What's bad? What's ugly? What clients should we be going for? Do we have any clients that we shouldn't be working for? What's the kind of the genesis of this agency? And you find out very, very quickly that Wyden and Kennedy in India was actually really design-driven, right? Brilliantly design-driven. And they'd come up with this very simple philosophy of they focused on brands, not ads, right? So they had built the creative founder who Dan Wyden did the deal with was an genius designer. And he had created in his previous life, in another agency, this really, really famous brand that still exists in India today. He probably created it in the late 90s or early noughties called Make in India, right? Then uh, um, then he created, sorry, no, Make in India he created at Widen. Incredible India he created in his previous life. And then he created this brand for India's most successful airline, right? Imagine the success of EasyJet, plus Ryanair, that's what Indigo was. Right. And the success of that is twofold. It's operational excellence from the com company and brand excellence from the design partner, Wyden and Kennedy, right? We designed the logo. We designed the cabin crew outfits. We designed the boarding passes. We designed everything in the company. Even I think, this is where myth and reality sort of merge, even the call hold, the holding at the airport was 6E because it was sexy, right? <laughs> but everything was an opportunity to have a conversation with your user. Yeah. And I learned so much around design and design thinking and brand over advertising. Because if you work in the big central hubs, right, whether it's London or Paris or New York or wherever it, it is, you get to do the really, really big stuff and you get excited about making big Super Bowl films or kind of, you know, Christmas films and all that kind of stuff. But if you work in, if your mindset's different 
and everything is a kind of blank canvas for creativity, you can really build a brand from the bottom up, right? Yeah. And that kind of really defined, if you look at Apple, that's what really drove a bunch of their growth because they took a load of money out of making advertising, put it into the stores because that branded experience was phenomenal and they make great products. They did loads of other things as well. But that kind of this notion of doing all of these things was super important to the founder of the, of the agency. So that taught me a lot. He then went on to create another really phenomenal brand called Make in India. And again, that was the government's initiative to encourage foreign investment into India, manufacturing foreign investment. So when you work in a company with that kind of pedigree, your job there is to try and take on that baton of design and every single touch point matters rather than going what I've been used to in different parts of the world, we're going to make some TV ads. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And I think just how you've explained how the design, the design was so important. It's like when something... When a when something has been planned out that deeply on the design, it advertises itself anyway. Yeah. Because the person that's going through that experience is enjoying it and they'll happily then kind of refer their friends or their family to say, Hey, you should try this out. Have yeah. a great experience with this and that. It's the reason why you get an app when you get a an iPhone or an iPad and you open it and it turns on, they make sure it's charged so it turns on, right? Yeah. And then that experience begins. Even opening the box of those products yeah. is an experience in itself. There's a famous Steve Jobs quote I've heard about um, um, the, you know, the Yo. as you open the box, yeah. that little noise, he'd have like 15 versions of them. And he'd pick, I want that one. Yeah. Like that experience is really, really important because think about it, right? billion and a half people in India, multiple languages, multiple layers of literacy, language, culture, aspiration, wealth, right? Design is what unlocks that. Because mm. if you design something beautiful, whether it be product design or experience design or communications design, we didn't use that many words because literacy was an issue and also people spoke different languages. Mm -hmm. So visual design is the thing that really, really connects a billion and a half people. And it was very similar to that Samaritan story, right? We chose design intentionally because if people's ability to read is compromised or minimized or reduced because of language or literacy or whatever, design is very, very uniting, which is why that pop of the Apple, uh, of the iPhone, is the same whether you're in Berlin, Bangalore, or Bogota, right? It's exactly that same feeling that that user, that experience that the people get. So you've lived and worked, obviously, in India now. What are some of the preconceptions people may have about India that you know to be absolutely false? Yeah. You've been there, you've lived there. Um, again, these kind of stories sort of change over time in terms of the preconceptions. I think as the world gets a bit smaller and also India stands taller, those preconceptions are reduced, right? But what's really, really fascinating is, and stereotypes and preconceptions are often based in some form of truth, right? It's just whether that is kind of normalized or normal or the exception, right? And most of these stereotypes tend to become smaller examples because different narratives and different behaviors are taking over. The, the one that's most interesting, and I was having a discussion with my family about it recently, so I don't know if you're aware, India was the first to land a rocket, the, the Chandrayaan, on mm. the, the, the other south other side, side of the moon. Of the moon. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Never been done before. Mm. Not by America, not by Russia, not by UK, not by any other country. And it's even harder, that side, than it the is. other side. Yeah. And what's really, really fascinating about that narrative of someone in the West who's from India has left and then gone back and then come back. So it's kind of this very weird sense of my identity and who I actually am. Mm. Am I British? Am I Indian? The answer is yes. Which one am I? I don't know. It's very, very confusing. But what's really fascinating about that narrative is you see the growth in India. You see how they've just hosted like a really big, I think the G20, right? Very, very recently in Delhi and a bunch of other things in terms of the growth of the country. That's really, really Fascinating. Of course, there are loads and loads of problems. But what I found really, really fascinating is news stations around the world that go, how dare they spend all that money going to the moon when they've got 
200 million, 300 million people who are starving below the breadline. Right. And I think that sort of talks about kind of prejudices that don't really leave people. And those are going to be like, will take hundreds of years or at least 100 years to change, which is the reason India does that is really, really simple, right? One is to show phenomenal technology, engineering, astrophysics, smarts, to get something from here onto that side of the moon. It's amazing. Hopefully, an act like that can act as a catalyst. And what I mean by that is it should catalyze belief in oneself as an Indian, right? that we can do something no one on this planet's ever done. So that is a sense of confidence and your ability to stand that much taller in every walk of life, right? Whether you work in retail, whether you work in the tech sector, whether you're a businessman, whether you're a kid coming out of college, there is a sense of kind of confidence that you have from that kind of act that your nation's able to do, which means I can play on the global stage too. There's that piece. The second part, I think, what's really, really important is what that kind of things will hopefully kick into gear is a movement of confidence and entrepreneurship and creativity and commerce and will move everything forward. Mm -hmm. And that act will hopefully raise the ceiling for the tiny portion. And by tiny portion, I mean 100 million people, which is bigger than the UK, but also will raise the floor for the other 1.2 or billion people. And I think you don't understand when you make a comment like that, the psychological impact of those kinds of acts, mm. right? One could have probably said about Kennedy back in the 60s, America's got enough problems. Why is it spending money trying to get man on the moon? Mm. Mm. Right? And I don't see why other nations, whether it's India or Nigeria or South Africa, can't demonstrate acts of sheer audacity and ingenuity and creativity whilst also having problems of being in a growth market and at widen we always call them growth markets never developing markets mm. right we're in a growth market whereby you are able to live with the contradictions of both literally a moonshot and then trying to grow a billion people and move them forward this is a great point mm -hmm. and so Ash and I, we've got Unified Creative, our industry movement. We've since launched that in the space industry, uh, Paris Space Week last, uh, earlier this year. And we see a lot of startups in that industry. Yeah. And there's a lot of money there. Yeah. There's a lot of funding. That industry is recession proof. Yeah. Because the funding is, you know, these projects take decades. Yeah. And so, as you said, like the opportunities that can bring to a country to bring, you know, to develop a, a, the, the space industry yeah. for, for startups, you know, people, entrepreneurs wanting to get into business. Completely. It just does so much for that. And, and the beauty of that is it's both a grower of certain types of application, right? And if you break that world down, there's creativity, there's incredible engineering, there's understanding kind of astrophysics, there's all of those kind of technology, right? Mm -hmm. And that, Yes, for a specific industry, but the application of all of those skill sets is just as applicable if you're creating the next Uber or the next Airbnb or the next Spotify or the next whatever it is, as it is to creating something that's very related to, to space. And hopefully those kinds of acts are what really push kind of nations forward in the same way athletic feats push a nation forward, mm. right? No one says, oh, what's India doing with the cricket team winning the World Cup or winning this when they've got a billion people who are starving, yeah. right? And I, I, that's the thing was you need to be able to live with contradictions and understand that you can literally shoot for the moon and work very, very hard in trying to lift the floor for a billion people both at the same time. And one is not being done in the at the expense of the mm. other. Yeah, and I think that's really, really important. And that's that's a that's a big issue around the kind of cultural, kind of assimilation that people have, based on lots of negative stereotypes that you have about a space or a people or a culture or a, whether it's north and south or in South Africa it was Joburg and Cape Town. You know, there's just all of these kind of dividers are there, and if you've been lucky enough, like I have, in to live in loads of spaces, 
you look for the unifiers much more than the dividers because mm-hmm. you see lots of commonalities of patterns of culture of commerce of kind of people's kind of ability to grow and succeed in spite of formal systems yeah. rather than because of them so that's really really kind of interesting to watch across different spaces so 2022 you go through something very difficult um walk us through the events of the day where you're heading to the hospital and you're off to get some results yeah um so uh, i'm in bangalore uh and my mum had had some tests done so i kind of drive to the hospital to um pick up the tests and you go into this hospital and it's kind of quite a weird way in which something like this is delivered you literally go to what feels like the mail room and someone hands you a piece of paper there's no doctor nothing so i'm just pick up this paper go to the car sit down and i open it and i sort of start reading it and some of it makes sense and some of it doesn't quite make sense uh, i'm not a medical person so the first thing i do is um i phone my wife uh who's a doctor which is quite helpful um and what are you thinking when you phone what are you concerned I'm about thinking so the tests were for cancer uh so that was what we were trying to find out whether she had cancer what kind of cancer it was what kind of stage and how did it spread and where did it start all of those kinds of things so when you call your wife you're not really sure what's what the situation I, is i have a sense that it's not good but i don't know exactly what not good looks like mm. so the first thing i do was take a photo send it to her on whatsapp and then she talks to me uh and basically explains that mum's got breast cancer it is stage 4 breast cancer which is obviously not very good uh and it has spread to various places helpfully via the lymph nodes and the bones and not actually from a to other organs so that's mm. really really helpful uh how were your emotions at I this time here break down this? in tears uh, i'm sat in a car on a kind of quiet road and i'm sort of in tears uh and then my wife is obviously amazing says listen you have to be strong because you have to go and talk to her about this now mm. so i pull myself together go for a walk have a coffee get in the car and then drive home and then i speak to mum uh and i tell my parents that i didn't get the results because i wanted to tell her and find out whether she wanted me to tell my dad who's a bit older so we go for a drive uh and then i kind of make up a reason to go for a drive we'll get a spot of lunch or do some shopping or whatever and we pull in the cycle and she's like why have you pull, pulled over and i'm just like well because the i did get the results and this is what's happened and my mom is very very strong uh kind of like the kind of the rock that i was called the rock the whole of the family together she obviously gets very very upset um and we start having a conversation about what to do and how to go forward and when do we tell dad and do all of those kinds of things which kind of if i'm really honest all of it's a bit of a blur this must have been really really hard to to tell your your own mother this news yeah i think is one of the hardest things you i've ever had to do is to break that news to her um what was it like see you know she's your rock and seeing her take it take the news and it obviously understandably very emotional yeah it's 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 very difficult uh that whole episode is a bit of a blur because i think she started crying and probably i did as well and i tried to hold my tears back to try and stay calm and kind of strong for her mm-hmm. uh and then you start having conversations you sort of you know put a try and put aside the emotions and the impact it has kind of you on both of you and the family emotionally and psychologically and start to get a little bit practical if you can in terms of what the next steps are and what one does and how you want to kind of go about it so that was really really tough um in a kind of weird way you kind of go things sort of happen for a reason and the fact that it happened when i was working in india is fortuitous if one can use that word in relation to cancer because mm-hmm. i could have been in joburg i could have been in london i could have been 
in New Zealand. I could have been anywhere else. The fact that I was able to be there when she heard that news rather than hear it from her on the phone mm. and be helpless and thousands of miles away mm. yeah. was really, really like, I was really glad I was able to be there. And most importantly, having had some treatment and medication, she touch wood seems to be on the mend and is getting a bit better, Amazing, which is fantastic. Mm, and also brilliant. I was able to be there for that as well in terms of taking her to the hospital and deciding on the medication and having my wife as a doctor help with some of that mm. kind of decision making is really, really useful. So that was, yeah, it was difficult. It was, it was, it was um, something that I hope not many people have to do, but it is important that when you realize that you need to be strong for the other person, you find that strength in you sometimes. It's a bit like, you know, with, with children, when you have to tell them bad news, you find that strength in you because you have to be the strong one in, in this. And if you want to go and be upset, go away and be upset, but try and stay as strong and as uh, as together as possible. Yeah. Very positive news to hear that things yeah. are moving in a positive direction, yes, which is yeah. really great. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of people, as you said, I think you've probably experienced this now that so many people have gone through something similar. Yeah, and I think you, you kind of switch in, and weirdly, the more you hear others have gone through this, the more like not alone you are you mm -hmm. feel that others have gone through similar things and they've come through it. and even if they haven't with relatives passing you know that you're not on your own so that mm -hmm. process is really really important so again you know we've had people in our family that have gone through this people in our wife's family that have gone through this so that kind of sense that this isn't happening to me and i'm on my own and happening to me for the first time is also really really helpful yeah sure and that what you say there is one of the big drivers behind this podcast we want people to feel like they're not alone going through mm -hmm. whatever difficult moment they're going through and to hear people like you who've achieved so much and yeah. and and not let things like that stop them and keep moving forward and keep succeeding to know that you're not alone you're not yeah you don't need to go through this uh, alone and that there is hope there's people like yourself and others who just go on to great things and they and they um, find that strength inside yeah. to keep moving forward. And that's the key, focus on that strength. And yeah, and also you, I think you you draw on what's what gives you strength. For some people it's faith, for other people it's family, for other people it's talking about it, for some people it's not talking about it. Mm -hmm. There is no one way to cope. Mm -hmm. And I've probably gone through all of those different iterations I just outlined at various times. And there was a point where I wouldn't tell anyone at work about it. Mm -hmm. And then actually talking about it with people from work who are friends, but not like, you know, my best friends or family was actually quite helpful. And then they then start to, oh, my aunt and my have gone through this. And suddenly you almost feel like it's a burden off your shoulders or off your chest in terms of being able to talk about these kinds of things. Yeah. So, yeah, it was uh, it was tough. It was tough. What, what do you think the lesson from the story is? I, I really I resonate with that, that fact to find out what gives you the strength and also to manage your approach so that you can be in the best state to deliver the news and to be be there for that person. And then if you need to, you know, break down or gather yourself, you do that somewhere else so that they see you in strength and they 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 can like bounce off that or connect with that while you gather yourself yeah. because I've been through personal issues too where I had to be the strong one and kind of look look after you know other people and try and not let them know or see you mm. know uh, the the challenge I was personally going mm. through in that scenario yeah mm. and it's hard right because you you have to I think that's the wonder of kind of humanity you you draw on that strength and you find it within yourself mm. somehow mm. you don't really know how you did it but you just do it mm -hmm. so yeah you've left the industry well yes you've left the <laughs> advertising industry yes uh you've moved brand side yes you've moved into another industry yes uh tell us a story how did this come about and um and why did you make that decision um 
I've I've always flirted with brand side, client side, whatever you want to call it, and almost made three moves and for various life reasons ended up staying within advertising. Um, and I was quite keen on just exploring kind of a different challenge. I'd worked in phenomenal agencies, honestly. It is the best career because it is full of like amazing people and you're surrounded by creativity every day and the smarts and the resilience and the kind of kind of savvy of people that you work with in every single department is is great. And it's a really, really energizing career. So I would heartily recommend it to anyone who wants to kind of join the creative industry. Join, it's, it's a very, very ex- exciting time. But I just, having done that for kind of 18, 19, 20 years, you just want a little bit of a change. And I decided that now was a good time for me to explore and to take that change seriously so i started looking at a bunch of things uh i almost took a another brand side role in the middle east didn't feel quite right so i said no to that one and then spoke to a few companies and then found this weird left field opportunity that i never thought i would gravitate towards but met this pretty inspiring founder who had built something pretty impressive both from a cultural point of view for the organization and also a commercial point of view in terms of the organization's growth and rapid ascent and he talked to me and said look he wants to do another kind of pivot slash flipping the industry on its head to do something different and in order for him to do that, he wanted people outside the space that they operate in. And he thought I could help. And I felt I could help too. So I jumped in. So I joined as CMO of a brilliant company called Third Way, who are kind of in the interior design and build and architecture space in the corporate real estate space. So we've worked with some phenomenal companies. And our role is to create amazing kind of designed corporate working spaces can you name some of the the clients that you've worked with yeah so like like i said we kind of specialize in creating workplaces for clients so we've worked with some great companies so for example we work with deloitte we have worked with figma we have worked with revolut so we have worked with some really interesting companies in a variety of sectors so we're quite sector agnostic Mm. and we work with landlords we work directly with tenants and basically we create spaces for kind of companies to get the best out of their people. It's a really, really simple philosophy of how we started. And what's interesting is the name of the company is Third Way because what I learned, what I've learned in the last couple of months I've been here is the first way was architects designing spaces for kind of companies mm-hmm. and that had its pros and its cons. Um, one of the issues of it was speed and cost was quite difficult. The second way almost, which doesn't, no one calls it that, but what then happened was a lot of the contractors decided that they could work with the architects and do the build process. Mm-hmm. So what that, does that mean for a layman? So you have an architect, so you're a company, let's imagine you are Figma, right? You want an office, okay? You want a office that has some functional requirements, desks and people and headcount and square foot, and I want to be in East London or West London, whatever it is right and then you have some requirements that are kind of more psychological and cultural right you want a place where people collaborate you want a place where your team are much more productive where you can really build your culture and engage your staff so we would talk to you and understand what your needs are we would then create the interior design if there's any architecture that needs to be done we can do that and then we would basically map out a build and a cost for that space Mm. so for us that's kind of my output of creativity which is really important to me has moved from a billboard back in the days or a radio ad or a tv ad or piece of content to an actual physical space yeah and what's really fascinating for me is the complexity of this industry is like i'm learning so much you know the joke always was nobody died it's just advertising if someone doesn't do their job in this industry, people die, mm. yeah. right? So the complexity of creating something from paper 
and raising it up from the ground mm -hmm. is phenomenal. And the talent and the different skill sets and the competencies that one needs in this sector is really, really fascinating. You said something that was quite interesting. The comparison between going to Joburg and joining this company. Yes. What was it? Um, my, my thing always was, you know, jumping on a plane, going to a country I'd never been to was obviously quite daunting. The thing around going to Johannesburg and working at a creative agency there, it is different. The culture is different. The structure is different. The process is different. The people are different. But I kind of know what I'm doing because it's something you build your 10,000 hours doing marketing, communications, advertising, yeah. right? And you lead a creative company. And I'd never led a company before, but I led a piece of business or two or three pieces of business. Mm -hmm. So that didn't feel, it felt challenging, but it wasn't daunting. Mm -hmm. Going from being an agency partner, an agency leader, coming to become a CMO, that for me is a bigger leap, mm -hmm. right? I would say for three reasons. One is I've been out of the UK for almost 10 years. So the UK has changed a lot, back a lot for Christmas and summers and whatever, but I haven't worked here. Yeah. The second piece is that transition from agency world to client world mm. is fascinating. And I've spoken to so many clients around the challenges of working in a marketing organization and the complexities of taking ideas through, talking to engineering and product and finance and HR and sales through that. And whilst you hear them, you don't really understand the complexities of that that I'm seeing here. And it's really, really fascinating. And then the third piece is kind of the complexities of what we do. It's really, really difficult. So if you make a decision, the knock-on implications of that decision are much more complicated yeah. in a large client organization than they would be in an agency. Mm. So for me, is I'd actually feel that the leap from London to Joburg was a hop and skip <laughs> rather than the jump from Delhi, Widen and Kennedy advertising to coming all the way over here to work in the, the commercial real estate space. Yeah. You know, the people at, at Third Way, they must think, who's this guy? <laughs> yeah. He's, he's never worked a day in his life in this industry. <laughs> What's he going to tell us about, you know, how to market this brand? Yeah. How do you... Obviously, you're phenomenally talented. We know that. We know. How that. do you build that trust for anybody going into a new industry or new, you know, new company? How do you uh, build that trust? And earn it? Wesley, I'm wondering whether you've been sneaking into our office and finding that out. <laughs> that was a direct <laughs> quote. Absolutely. <laughs> no, the, the but the challenge of doing that is really simple, and why I, well, it's it's difficult to achieve, but it's simple in terms of the steps. Because when I left London to go to Joburg, when I left Joburg to go to Delhi, your mindset needs to be, I know nothing. Mm. And you need to be okay with knowing nothing. And you need to tell people that you know nothing and you're there to learn, right? If you do that, you walk in with this wonderful alchemy of humility and curiosity. And then you apply what you do know to that. Yeah. by learning from them what the category rules are, what the market dynamics are, what the framework within which you can operate, how they make money, the complexity of the sales process, how long these things take. Mm. So that is the key, which is walk in and be very clear that you don't know anything and then learn and apply yourself. And that's kind of the process I'm going through now. I'm miles away from knowing what I need to know, but I'm a bit closer than I was two months ago when I started. <laughs> I've learned a bit more about the industry mm. in the last two months. And then the other pieces of round, one of the things that drew me to this company was the culture, right? And it was very, very strange. I was listening to the founder and CEO talk about his company and I could close my eyes and I could hear someone from Widen and Kennedy talking, mm -hmm. right? We believe in people. We believe in creativity and design. We will ensure that the clients we work for really value what we do, right? We will pour our heart and soul into creating a space that will drive your company's culture. 
that will drive your engagement, that will make your people more productive. So if you want that, we're here to help you. And a lot of companies, especially now, especially post-COVID, want that workplace, want that workspace to be a talent magnet again. Mm. And, you know, where it's going to fall, no one really knows. Right, when Zoom tells you it's time to go back to work, there's a sort of a clue in there. When Silicon Valley says you need to go back to work because we're not being as productive, we might be being more efficient, but are we being as effective? Are we being as creative? We don't know yet. But that's kind of one of our roles. And one of the most interesting things I've heard, again, is from a creative person in the company. When I was talking to her, I said, you know, what gets you out of bed? Why are you working in this industry? And she talked about the privilege she has of creating inclusive workspaces. And I didn't really understand what she meant. I asked her to explain. She said, look, if you look at the nature of the office work, wherever that thing, place you go, one spends more and more of their time there, right? From clocking in at nine and leaving at five, and no one really does that anymore. What a privilege, and these are her words, not mine, what a privilege it is to create a space that's more inclusive for people of color, for women, for people with different, who are differently abled, for people with kind of neurodivergence challenges. Like, it's a really interesting privilege that we have to make society more inclusive. And that's a really fascinating way to think about being a creative and a designer in this industry and the role and impact you can have in, uh, on society. Mm-hmm. And when you work for a company that has that view of the world and that kind of culture, it's really, really fascinating. And kind of why you turn up to work, yes, you want to create an amazing space. Yes, you want to grow commercially, but you're also wanting to have a different impact on society. And, you know, like the, there, there is a kind of brilliant mission in the company, which is to redefine the O word, right? What this office thing needs to be is quite archaic, right? Take away the screens and take away a couple of bean bags and possibly a coffee and an espresso machine, the office today is very similar to what it was 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago. So we're on a little bit of a mission to try and redefine what that is. Not in our view, because it doesn't matter what we think. It might be different if you're Figma or if you're Revolut or if you're Deloitte or if you are a large landlord with a... 100,000 square foot building in Liverpool Street. Mm. Yeah. And what we're trying to do is redefine what that office is going to be for the companies and the people that inhabit that space. It's the same concept as what you spoke about with AMV, yeah. you know, and not saying, okay, we in London and know how to market Guinness in Joburg. Actually, let's listen on the ground and yeah. speak to the mm. people who know the culture and how the brand is perceived there. And it's, it's a similar thing of just taking in that feedback to form the solution rather than saying you know how to do these things. Yeah, yeah and look, there's, there's some really interesting themes and it happens when you think you work at phenomenal companies, like phenomenal creative companies. And more often than not, they tend to be slightly driven by a bigger zeal than a commercial endpoint. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong, Driving a commercial growth is very, very important because it buys you lots of things. But, you know, you work for widening Kennedy, right? One of the widenisms was Dan Wyden always talked about was walk in stupid, right? Walk into this place. He's, he, there's so many amazing speeches of him you can find online. But he talks about the minute you think you figured it out, you're dead. Mm. Right? And if you've got that mindset, and you've got a mindset around creativity can solve the world, right? I worked at AMV, it didn't work on it, but the company worked on Make Poverty History, right? A phenomenal copywriter came up with those words and we created a kind of amazing movement around those kinds of things in terms of being a force for good. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you think and believe that creativity can change the world, when you think you can believe and believe that design can change the world and make the world a better place, those are quite special places to work and special companies to work in. Yeah, inspires great work then because there's no 
limits. You're just behind the mission of completely delivery. Completely, and it kind of you know, I think you need a bigger reason to get out of bed mm. than just punching your clock and doing your job. And I think that's a big part around why lots of companies, not people, companies are struggling with this hybrid working thing. And I think what you will start to discover over the next three to five years is the companies that have a more clear sense of identity and culture will thrive when their people can come in and kind of bask in that culture of creativity. Mm -hmm. I think it was Steve Jobs who said like, the, re- the the smart stuff, the good stuff, the real stuff happens in the coffees and the loos of companies, not in the boardrooms, because people just say things to make themselves sound clever in a boardroom. The real truth starts to come when you just go, hey, can I just, can you have a look at this? That's That spontaneity is hard to do on Zoom mm. or on Teams. Mm. So if you're in a creative industry, you're in a creative culture, you know, sitting in on Zoom and having the same 50 tabs as the next company and the next company, I don't think that's a good place for creative companies to be, right? I think you need to bring people in so they can feel that because if you're a truly creative company that has great culture and great values, that's a big part of why someone's working for you, not just the paycheck. Mm. Well, you've answered our final question, which is great, which is about, you know, which we end each episode now on about what you see as the future of, 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 the, of the industry. And which in your case now is the architecture and interior design industry. And that's fascinating. There's another point I would like to end on. Yeah. Which is there's been a person that's consistently part of your story who sounds amazing, who we haven't really talked about. Your wife. Mm. <laughs> yes. I mean, to be one, to, to go to Joburg and just be like, yeah, okay, let's do it. Because that's the vibe I get. Yeah. And then, you know, to be three weeks away from be- giving birth. Is that right? No, no, Look, three weeks three from weeks being able to fly. From being able to fly. Yeah. Uh, just flying and going, yeah, okay, let's do it. And the words she said to you on the phone when you were having this moment of, of finding out the results of, your mother's um, test results, just so powerful. What what a person. Yeah, I'm pretty lucky. Uh, I, I think one of my biggest life skills is choosing phenomenal partners, whether it's kind of creative partners or mm-hmm. work or the most important partner of them all. Um, yeah, she's amazing. She's a doctor. She's a qualified coach, life coach. Uh, she's very smart. Uh, she is very driven, very supportive. How did and you meet? Uh, we met at university. So I was in the University of Bath uh, doing a business degree and she was uh, a doctor. Uh, she was at uh, in London. So I met at a friend. We met at one of my friend's childhood friend's birthday parties. I'd lost touch with him for about seven, eight years. And I called him. I said, look, it's super busy at uni. If I work my socks off, is anything happening in the first after the first two months as in March? He goes, that's my birthday. Come to London. So I went to London and then I met her at that party. So it was great. Lovely. Lovely. Yeah, what a great story. Mm. Well, it, it just shows how amazing it is to have a, an incredible yeah, life partner. Um, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, I lucked out there. Beautiful. <laughs> All right. Um, we're ending with a poem. I'll do a little summary of what I see the lessons from your story are and then we'll get to the poem. But I think you've just got this amazing attitude for change Mm. and for being willing to take that leap into the unknown and going this sounds crazy let's do it and that 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 thing stops so many people from going on this you know wild incredible journey yeah and learning so much and i think you've you know you've obviously you've got so many benefits from doing that of seeing different cultures and living in different places and i think people can really learn from your appetite and your wife's appetite for um, you know, jumping into the unknown and seeing where it takes you. Yeah. And I think it's very, very, yeah, inspirational. Thank you. Yeah, and part of me, which I didn't really talk about, is I think we all have it to an extent. I've got a pretty heavy dosage of imposter syndrome. And I think if you've got that, I think the one thing you need to really understand is you wouldn't be offered this thing that felt crazy, and a ridiculous sleep, and how am I going to ever do that if someone didn't think you were capable? Mm. 
right? And if the someone who's offering it to you is smart and someone you respect, back the fact that they've backed you, even if you don't back yourself, mm. right? They are taking this bet on you, not because they want the thing you're going to do to fail or you to fail, because they've seen something in you that you don't see. And depending on your level of imposter syndrome, it's more or less hidden. And take that leap, right? And kind of do that thing knowing that the people who are putting you there are doing it because they think you're good at what you do and you will make that thing work. And as a result, you're going to have a much more enriching and different experience. Now, it could be something as crazy as going to Joburg and then going to Delhi, or it could be leaving marketing, going to advertising, or even your next role that you take, or going from advertising into an adjacent category. It doesn't really matter. I think you do need to back the fact that someone is betting on you and take a lot of solace and a lot of kind of like belief from that. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And as another guest, Harjo Singh said, do not dim your lights. <laughs> Get them to wear sunglasses. Let them wear sunglasses. <laughs> but, it, but it's just so shine. true, isn't it? You sit there kind of, you just play to your strengths, right? There's some stuff that you're not, no one's good at everything. Play to your strengths. And if you're an outsider and it's different, the reason you're going there is because you're an outsider and it's different. Like they don't want someone who's think, gonna think the same way as everyone else does. Mm. So yeah, just back yourself. Love that. Absolutely. And okay. Then, I just have one more question before then as well. So throughout your journey and your career, you've worked with many different leaders and many different people within different positions. But if you could bring all these leaders back around one table, what do you think the most important topic to discuss should be? Brilliant question. I, I think there's a big part around diverse thinking, mm. right? And the reason I find that really fascinating is if I looked at the various lessons I've learned, whether they're really big lessons or whether they're small lessons, they have come from very, very different people, mm -hmm. right? They've come from a 21 year old designer from India, right? They've come from a 50 year old, not sure how old this guy is, kind of chief creative officer from Joburg, mm -hmm. right? For me, that diversity of thinking, and obviously linked to that is a variety of factors like age and gender and socioeconomic background and religious beliefs and all of those kinds of things, right? The kind of ethnicity. Yeah. But there's also the diversity of thought that will come from someone being neurodivergent, mm -hmm. right? approaching problems in different ways those kinds of things are really really important and if you get the right diversity of thought what then tends to happen is you get more interesting solutions to solve problems like my my really strong belief is creativity is an act of solving a problem now problem can be anything from engineering to artistic to commercial and the more divergent the inputs, the more interesting the outputs. And I think from a industry that is really leaning into, I'm talking about advertising here, into solving that problem, I think we need to, we, they, one needs to work a lot harder to do that. But also remember the divergence of thought just isn't things like gender and color, although that's a really, really important starting point. But there's loads of other divergences of thought. And it's kind of like, where do you go looking for those minds? I think it's also really, really important. Excellent. Thank you for that answer. And now for the final poem to end what has been another great episode of How I Became. A nomadic story that started with traveling across the world to new locations. Who would have guessed he would be doing the same thing decades later for his occupation? Using insights to communicate with some of the audiences most in need, to learning the importance to sticking to what works and not letting the buzz of following trends take the lead. Humility and curiosity are two things that can help you flourish. Being truthful that you may not know anything can be the fertilizer to enable your true self to be nourished. To now moving to a new industry, a space that he never thought he would consider. 
I'm sure we will soon see the great work that he is next to deliver. That's a fantastic way to end. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today. That was great, Ash. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Thank you. All right. <laughs> and that is how you became CMO of The Third Way. Thanks, gents. <laughs> <laughs>